Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now the i3-12300 here is currently the best desktop core i3 processor available. It's also the most expensive. It will outperform previous generation i5 CPUs, namely the 10400F and 11400F, but so will the lower cost 12100F i3, which is the easier to recommend chip. The i5-12400F on the other hand, or in the other hand I should say, has two more cores and is a better all-rounder. It'll perform better in CPU intensive tasks and should offer slightly higher frame rates in games. Today I thought it would be interesting to compare the best 12th gen i3 to the cheapest 12th gen i5 to see how much more performance two extra cores and four extra threads will get you. In Cinebench R20, both processors will perform pretty much identically in terms of a single core score, which was to be expected, but the multi-core results paint a different picture. These differences demonstrate the benefits of the extra core and thread count, and what this means in terms of real-world performance is that things like rendering a video will be quite a bit quicker when using the 12400F. That's not to say the 12300 is slow, not by any means. In fact, it's still a fantastic choice for an entry-level content creation computer build. For the gaming tests, I paired both processors with 16 gigabytes of 3200MHz DDR4, that's two 8GB sticks in dual channel, as well as my RTX 3070. Like with all CPU comparisons, I used 1080p resolution to try and minimise a GPU bottleneck, though in some cases the i3 caused no issues for the graphics card. The i5 could certainly handle a faster GPU, but I actually think that a 3070 is a realistic pairing for both. Just be aware that the performance differences between the CPUs may be more significant with an even faster card, but the 3070 is the best GPU that I own at the moment. If you own a weaker graphics card, then you can expect some of the differences in game to be smaller, and maybe there will be no difference between the i3 and i5, meaning that the i3 might be the better buy for you, as more CPU power would potentially go to waste. CSGO is first up and this is where we saw the biggest differences today, as expected considering the CPU intensive nature of the game. Both processors averaged over 400 FPS, both shared a similar 1% low and both offered a very good experience overall. Cyberpunk 2077 can be very CPU intensive in busier areas, especially with the crowd density option turned up like it is here. Here both chips offered a very respectable average in pairing with the RTX card, though the 4 cores and 8 threads of the i3 weren't quite enough to keep our percentile figures above 60fps. The game still ran very well of course and the experience was solid. The i5 certainly felt smoother to play on but again that doesn't mean the i3 was bad, quite the opposite in fact. It really is a very good CPU, but as I said at the start, the 12100F will offer a very similar, if not identical, gaming experience, and from what I've seen in the UK at least, it is cheaper and more widely available. It definitely makes more sense to buy. It's a similar story in Far Cry 6, the averages were both very good, and unless you had a frame counter enabled like I do, you wouldn't be able to tell the differences between the two results when actually playing. This goes for the percentile lows in this case too because the game didn't dip below 60 with either configuration. There were no points during my testing when I thought, yeah, I'm definitely playing on an i3, that just didn't happen. Sure, the differences may be more significant with a faster card, perhaps a 3080, but it's unlikely you'd actually pair an i3 with a faster card. A solid result for both 12th generation parts in this test. In Forza Horizon 5, the extra cores and threads of the i5 definitely helped out once again with noticeably higher figures in terms of those percentile lows. This is basically what it comes down to across the board. Both CPUs will output very good and sometimes very comparable averages, at least with a 3070, but the differences between the two and the biggest change in data comes from the 1.1% lows. This data is arguably more important because it represents the consistency of the game. A higher average is all well and good, but if a game is hitting 100 FPS and then dropping to say 40 periodically, it's not going to feel very good to play overall. Thankfully, even with the differences exhibited here, both sets of percentile lows are respectable and reflect a smooth gameplay experience. 
Because sometimes I do stupid things like accidentally delete 100 gigabyte game files from my hard drive, I'm testing GTA 4 instead of GTA 5. In my opinion, 4 is the better game anyway, and it certainly gives hardware a tougher time. I'm actually using the DXVK plugin as recommended by a lot of you, and it seriously improved my performance. DXVK makes the game run with Vulkan instead, I think that's the basic gist of it, and it's totally reinvented my GTA 4 on PC experience. Now both processors did a fantastic job here. The i3 once again had lower 1 and 0.1% numbers, with that lower figure being particularly noticeable. In terms of actual gameplay, it just meant that there were a few more noticeable micro stutters in certain areas, areas that were full of cars or pedestrians. I'd always recommend turning the visual quality sliders down a bit from the in-game menu to alleviate this, but even when maxed out, there are noticeable improvements over running in the standard DX9 mode. Yeah, both the i3 and i5 do a great job here. Finally, it's Red Dead Redemption 2. I took a trip to Valentine today, a small town that still seems to take its toll on CPUs, thanks to the higher number of NPCs, I would assume. I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but once again the averages were very good, though the real differences came from the percentile lows. The lower core and thread count of the i3 just doesn't handle busier scenarios quite as well, but look, don't listen to anyone who says you shouldn't buy a new 12th gen i3 for modern gaming, because quite frankly they don't know what they're talking about. Yes, you'll need to upgrade sooner than you would if you bought an i5, but it's important to remember that not everyone can just go out and buy the better and more expensive option. Speaking of which, let me remind you that the 12100F is actually the better option than the 12300 due to better pricing and availability. But it does depend on where you live and honestly, you probably won't notice any difference in games or applications between the two CPUs. With all that said, the best i3 can sort of keep up with the cheapest i5 in terms of average performance in games. It's certainly close at least, but the consistency of the performance won't be as good. If you are planning on getting an entry level or mid-range graphics card, let's say for example an RTX 3050, then the i3 would be your best bet all day long. This goes for if you're buying an older flagship car too. A 1080 Ti, for example, would hit its performance ceiling before a 12th gen i3 would, in most games anyway, and to be honest, that's quite incredible. The i3 also gives you a little bit of room to upgrade, so if you did start with a mid-range or entry-level card, you could upgrade to something like a 3070 that I've got here, or maybe a 6700 XT from AMD, and not have to worry about upgrading the CPU right away either. That's all for this one then. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been helpful. If you like this video, leave a like on it down below, leave a dislike if you didn't, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already, and hopefully I'll see all of you in the next one.